Well, look, I want to start with the Word of God. And I've got a scripture here from Matthew chapter 9, verses um, 35 to 38. Okay. And it reads here in the Amplified Classic Version. You can read that on the screen. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news. That is the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And he was curing all kinds of disease and every weakness and infirmity. When he saw the throngs, that means when he saw the crowds, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered. And that word, as you see, it expands in the Amplified Classic. It says they were harassed, they were distressed, they were dejected, and they were helpless. Some versions say that they were afflicted. And it's saying they were like sheep without a shepherd. But we see in this scripture here that Jesus was moved by compassion. He had pity, he had sympathy for those who were bewildered. As I said, afflicted, harassed, distressed, dejected and helpless and the question i'm asking you this morning is what motivates you what moves you the scripture goes on to verse 37 and then he talking about jesus said to his disciples he said the harvest is plentiful the harvest is indeed plentiful but the laborers are few and he said in verse 38 something very powerful he said so pray Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into the harvest. He said to pray. Everyone say pray. pray. Jesus said to pray. He said to pray, 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 pray. To pray because we need laborers to step up and to step out in 2024. We need laborers to arise. Laborers to arise in 2024 to bring in the harvest. And I thank God for, the, for this church and for those who labor in this church. I also thank God for those of you who join us every Friday evening via Zoom for one hour to join us in the one hour Zoom prayer meeting. One hour. One hour a week. Jesus said, can you pray for at least one hour Amen. as Jesus said to his disciples in the garden of Gethsemane and I'm asking you can you please join us for one hour on a Friday out of your 168 hours in your week can you spare one hour to pray Amen. can you join us in our monthly prayer meeting at this stage it's only once a month I'm believing that's going to be happening weekly eventually but, you know, maybe you can give up you're watching the football or going out for a dinner or, you know, watching TV for a few hours on a Friday night once a month. You know, can you join us for a few hours just once a month out of your 732 hours on average a month? Just a few hours out of your 732 hours in your month to join us in prayer and worship. And um, as uh, you probably people might think that I'm trying to condemn you. And I can assure you, I, in no way, absolutely, am I not trying to condemn anybody. But just maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit may be convicting you. And there is a difference between condemning and conviction. Yes. Conviction's about awareness. The Holy Spirit may be moving upon your heart, convicting you. And the beauty of this conviction or awareness is that this is the first step to grow and change. On the other hand, Condemnation has guilt and punishment attached to it and there's, there's no wriggle room, there's no space to grow and change, there's only the consequences of actions. But for the Christian, conviction is designed to bring about confession, repentance and renewal in their relationship with God and what hopefully what you're doing in his kingdom. So I'm asking you this morning, are you ready? Are you willing and are you able are you ready, willing, and able to arise in 2024 and to be used by God? You know, church, it is a fact that one day, every single one of us yes. will have to give an account yes. of the gifts and the talents that we have been given by God. Yes. Every single one of us. And the question I'm asking you is, are you using your gifts, your talents, or are you hiding them? Yes. 
Now, there are several parables in the Word of God where Jesus gave out gifts, he gave out talents. There's many parables, and I could read, read them to you. Sometimes he gave one five, one he time he another gave them two, or some he gave one. And then there's other parables where the ten minutes, which I'm about to share with you, where he gave the same gift to each person and to ten different servants. But to some he'll give more than he'll give to others, but he expects you to be using the gifts that he has given you, whether they're, they're more than someone else, different to someone else, but he's expecting you to use your gifts and talents because there's going to come a time where you're going to have to give account for those gifts and talents. Now, I want to share with you from a parable uh, in Luke chapter 19. There's, there's many scriptures I could share with you about these type of parables, but I've chosen this one because it's actually very powerful when you understand the revelation from it, which I got many, many years ago. In fact, I keep my notes from overseas when I was evangelising over in Papua New Guinea and, and uh, Fiji, right in the scripture here in Luke chapter 19. And I just want to quickly sum up uh, verses 11 to 20. For time's sake, I'm not going to read them all to you, but we see here in this, in this parable, Jesus is talking about the fact that he gave 10 minors to 10 servants. Now, this is a king. A king giving out one minor to each of the ten servants. And then the king returned after some time. And the scripture tells us that some rejected the king. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. But when he came back, when the king returned, he said to the first one, what did you do with the minor that I gave you? And he said, I've got ten. And he said, well, you take ten cities. The next guy, he came, the other servant, he said, what did you do with the mine I gave you? And he said, I got five more. So he said, because of your faithfulness, you are now in charge of five cities. And then he came to a third guy, a third servant, and he said to him, what did you do? And I want to read to you, when the king returned to this servant, he actually said to the king that I went and hid your miner in a clock because I was afraid. And I want to read to you where we're stepping next in from Verse 20, I don't think you've got these scriptures, Sarah. You've got some of them, but I've got verse 20 to 27. I actually want to read to you. And it says, this is Jesus, the parable going on. He said, then the other came saying, Master, he is your minor, Mina, which I have kept away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. You might have from verse 22, do you, Sarah? 23. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. I didn't pass English at school. Praise God. But he said, <laughs> Collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Verse 23 says, Why then did you not put my money, his money, in a bank that at my coming I might have at least collected it with interest? This servant didn't do anything with the gift that he was given. He didn't even put it in a bank so that at least he could get some interest. Verse 24 says, And he said to those who stood by, Take the minute from him and give it to him who has ten minutes. But they said to him, Master, he already has ten. For I say to you, that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have even what he has, will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine. Now who is he referring to here? He said, bring here those enemies, enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and, and slay them before me. Now this is a, a, a pretty confronting piece of scripture that Jesus is telling a parable where he gave out 10, ten minutes and three of them came back with an answer one, one got ten, one got five, one just didn't do anything with it, didn't even bother to put it in a bank. But what happened to the other seven? What did the other seven do? They had total disregard for the gift that they were given, for the money that they were given, to the point where they had no, no connection with the king, didn't want him to reign over them. They did not even bother to do anything with that gift. They had total disregard for the gift that they were given. And the Bible tells us here 
that the king said to them that they were his enemies and that they were to be slain before him. Now this is a, a, is a very confronting piece of scripture. And the fact is that these people were given something from the king and they did absolutely nothing with it. And that is very, very poor of them. Unfortunately, they did not end up very well because the king, it actually tells us, actually slayed them. I want to read to you a poem right now called The Value of Time. And this is a, a poem that I read many years ago, but I've actually edited it a little bit to, to bring it up to modern time. I think it's a, a very old poem, so I have changed it a little bit. If you look up online, you'll find the original, but I'll read to you my version of it. It's called The Value of Time. You can see that up on the screen. To realise the value of five years, ask a prisoner who's been wrongly convicted. You know, there's an actual prisoner in the US, his name was Glenn Simmons, and he was actually wrongly convicted for 48 years, one month, and 18 days. He's been set free now, and you read his story online, and just amazing. He was convicted wrongly for 48 years. Let's go on. To realise the value of one year, ask a student who failed the final exam. To realise the value of one month, ask a mother who has given birth to a baby prematurely. To realise the value of a week, ask a person recovering from an accident or sickness. To realise the value of an hour, ask a very hungry man waiting for his dinner to cook. <laughs> <laughs> to realise to realise the value of 15 minutes, ask the person who is stuck in traffic and in desperate need to go to the bathroom. Especially if you've had a really bad curry the night before. No, that never happened to me. I don't think I've got to share about the time that I drank half a litre of cranberry juice that I was uh, a very long way from home. And anyway, I think I've got to just stop there on that street. It did not end well, praise God. Maybe I'll share that story one day. <laughs> to realise the value of one minute, ask the person who missed the train, the bus, or worse, missed the aeroplane. <laughs> to realise the value of a second, ask the pers a person who survived a near miss accident. And to realise the value of a millisecond, ask the sprinter who won a silver medal at the Olympics. The value of time. Time is precious. And we all here on earth have limited time. We all have 86,400 seconds in each day. And what are we doing with our time? Are we doing his will? Are we using our God-given talents? Or worse, are we hiding them? And worse, even again, having total disregard for the gifts and talents that God has given us. Church, what can we take with us? We can take absolutely nothing with us. Therefore, I'm, I'm urging you to leave a mark and to make a difference and not to waste your precious life. I encourage you to make the most of your life and to use your God-given talents and to be a humble follower of Jesus. We need to make a decision to deny self, to follow Jesus and take up our cross daily. I want to read to you a scripture here from Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 from the AMPC. And it reads, you can see that on the screen. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, that is, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interest, and take up his cross and follow me. That is, cleave steadfastly to me. Conform wholly to my example in living and, if need be, dying also. Jesus said, take up your cross, deny self and to follow me. And I want to read to you a few verses here from the New Living Translation, that same scripture, but a few verses from 24 to 28 in the New Living Translation. Again, you can follow that on the screen. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang out, if you sorry, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. 
And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? If anything, is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people, all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus was basically saying that a true follower or a true disciple must deny self, give up your own way and take up your cross and follow him. A disciple is a learner, a pupil or a follower. And to deny self literally means to forget oneself, to lose sight of oneself and one's own interest. The word follow does not mean. It does not mean to go in a direction or path that you choose. To follow means to go the leader's way to do their will. It simply means, it, sorry, it, may, it, it is saying that it's not you leading yourself, it's them leading you. I'll say that again. It's, it's not you leading yourself, it's them leading you. And Jesus also said, as found in Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 to 39. I want to read to you a few versions of this scripture. I'm not sure. Do we have the message? We do. Praise God. Firstly, the message translate. You're receiving from this. Yes. What a hard message to preach on the first Sunday of the year. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus said, If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. I love the way that, that, that message translation reads that scripture. I'm also going to read to you from the Amplified Version, and it says, And he who does not take his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living and, if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life in this world will eventually lose it through death and whoever loses his life in this world for my sake will find it, that is, life with me for all eternity. Taking up your cross. You know, a lot of people know that and hear that saying, but what does it truly mean? It does not mean that we need to suffer daily, but it does mean that we need to deny self to live for Jesus, that is to live a sacrificial life following his will and his purpose. The cross, as we know, is a symbol of death. It's a, it's a symbol of total sacrifice. And a true follower, a true disciple, who is a real follower, can, can be a person who truly denies self. Someone who really gives up their life to follow Jesus and to follow his will. I want to share with you an in-depth dictionary meaning of the word follow. It means to move behind in the same direction. It means to accept guidance, leadership, authority, and to give all allegiance to a leader. It means to comply with. It means to obey. It means to imitate or copy. And it means to attend to and to serve. And it also means an action of following or abiding. So I'm asking you as a follower, if you're a true follower of Jesus Christ, are you following? Are you moving behind in the same direction? Are you accepting his guidance, leadership, authority, and giving him allegiance? Are you complying? Are you obeying? Are you in obedience? Are you imitating or copying him? Are you attending and serving to the best of your ability. Well, you need to be honest with yourself. And I'm really asking you, are you truly a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, there can be no greater or clearer teaching anywhere on the meaning of being a disciple. This is how our master lived, so this is how his disciples must be living. And we must be, as true followers of Jesus, living completely and totally in the submission of the will of God. 
But let's take a look at uh, something that happened just before this scripture took place here, as we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. I want to read back a few verses, just so you understand the context of this script. And Jesus asked Peter, um, I want to read to you, for, I, I'm not sure if I gave you those, if you said, did I, Matthew, Matthew 16, verse 13? No. No. Do I give you that? No. Matthew 16, verse 13. This is, um, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? So he's asking them to answer their own way. And Simon Peter answered in verse 16, he said, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, Simon answered, oh, sorry, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is heaven. And I also say to you that you, Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that Jesus is the Christ. So we see here that Jesus is telling Peter, after he told him that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said to him, great Peter, he goes, you're a top bloke, you're my rock, and, and, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on earth, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then a little bit later, we go on to see, then Jesus telling Peter what his next step is. So I'm going to read to you from verse 21. And he said, Then Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. He must go and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it for you, Lord, this should not happen to you. And Jesus' response to him in verse 23 was, he turned to Peter, basically, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So, a few minutes before that, he's a top bloke, he's the best, and then all of a sudden when Peter decides that he's not following the will of Jesus, Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. So one second Peter's a rock, the next second he's a stumbling block. And a rock can either be a building stone or it can be a stumbling stone. And we need to choose, are we going to follow Jesus' will or are we going to do our own way? And we've got to completely be submitted to the will of the Father, whether we like it or not. True obedience is following his will, whether we like it or not. And I, I want to urge you this morning that we, as true disciples, we need to deny self and to take up our cross. Taking up our cross means we need to deny self and to carry our cross. We need to die to our own plan, to our worldly desires, our ambitions, our motives and our thoughts, our passions and cares. Totally denying and surrender all to his will, just as Jesus did on the cross. You know, our focus could truly be that on our next life, our eternal life, and in doing his will. Our goal for 2024, I'm praying and believing that your goal is to reach as many souls in the kingdom, to reach many souls this year, to take as many to heaven as possible whilst you still have the time. I, I believe that there may be some people shaken up by this message today. I believe some people may have been stirred up in their heart. Maybe you're not truly following the will of God in your life. And maybe you just need to repent today and to make a decision to seek God and to follow his will. I want to read to you another scripture here from Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. And it says, um, you can see on the screen, he says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So I ask you this morning, are you worthy? Are you truly denying self and following Jesus? As you know, time is short, time is precious, and we all have a vital role to play. 
I'm not going to read those next scriptures, Sarah. I'm just going to close here. But I'm going to I'm going to ask you right now just to close your heads and bow. Oh, sorry, no, close your eyes and bow your heads. I'm not going to I'm just saying if you're listening. If you're listening. That's good. Time is short, church. But I do implore you to leave a mark and to make a difference and not to waste your precious life. To be humble and be a true follower of Jesus. And I'm really believing that in 2024 that we can truly seek God, seek his will and to follow him. You know, we've all got gifts and talents and I'm asking you just to, just to think right now, what has the Lord given you that you can use for his kingdom? Are you seeking him and, and following him and just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do in this year? You know, as I said, we've got around 360 days left of this year to do whatever the Lord wills in our life. And only you can make a choice or make a decision to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to seek you and I'm going to follow your will in 2024. There are so many people that need to really understand and know the true gospel of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom. And I'm asking you right now just to take account of what you're doing. And, and I hope and pray that you will, if you need to repent, you'll do that right now and that you'll make a decision to follow the Lord in 2024 to serve him, to see the, 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 the lost saved, to see the sick healed, and to see those oppressed set free for his glory in 2024 in the mighty name of Jesus. Can we all stand, church? Hallelujah. So I really hope that message has spoken to you today, and I not the sort of message you want to kick the ear off and trying to bring people into conviction, but I really felt led by the Lord too that we've got work to do this year Amen. and we need labor. So, if anything, at least pray to the Lord of the harvest that He will raise up and send out labors for the harvest. Amen. We're going to be starting outreach meetings this year. Um, we're going to be really rich in the community in a big way, to park down the road, maybe setting up a barbecue on Saturday morning. So, we're going to need laborers and we're going to need people to come and to share their faith, to give testimonies, to encourage people, because we want to see as many people saved, healed, and delivered in 2024 as possible. But it's going to take laborers. It's going to take those who are willing to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow your will. I'm going to do what you want. Maybe the Lord's got something else in mind for you. Maybe he wants you to do your own thing in 2024. But I do urge you to seek him, to, to find out what he wants you to do, and so that in 2024, and, and that day when you stand before him, you can give an account and say, Lord, this is what I did with the talents and gifts that you gave me. So right now, as I pray, I pray, <laughs> Heavenly Father, over each and every person here right now, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that they will take the time to seek you. I pray, Lord, that you will show them exactly what you want them to do. Maybe it's a phone call to encourage a loved one or someone who's backslidden. Maybe it's getting out on the streets and preaching the gospel. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to your people today and that, Lord, that they will take that time to seek you, to raise, rise up, Lord, and to, to be boldly step up into your perfect will and plan for their life. And I pray, Lord, your favour, your peace, your protection upon every person here today, those who are away on holidays. And we ask for your blessing, favour, and protection upon us all right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to open the altar up here right now. So in